Hi, this is Scott Geitler from Come Talk. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Eric Sherry, considered by many to be the world's expert on the periodic table. Dr. Sherry teaches chemistry at UCLA and is the author of 14 esteemed books on the periodic table, the history of chemistry, and the philosophy of chemistry. He's also the founding editor of the Springer Journal Foundations in Chemistry. He was named the second most influential chemist in the world by academic influence. I believe people like Dr. Sherry, who give us a better understanding of why science is so important historically and philosophically, are vitally important to the future of our society. Dr. Sherry and I have an amazing conversation about science, chemistry, and the elements of the periodic table. I hope you enjoy. Well, Eric, it's great to see you again. Good and to see you, Scott. Thanks a lot. Really looking forward to this talk and um, great background. Have you, uh, have you read all those books? Uh, maybe 1% of them. <laughs> <laughs> or 1% of 1%. That's, uh, that's still a lot. That's still a lot of great books. So today I, um, yeah, I want to talk about, about yourself and, and the periodic table and some things in your books and some other things about you and maybe a little bit about chem talk, mm -hmm. about teaching. Sure. How's all that sound? Sounds good. My first question, I think, goes back to your, your birthplace. I'm always curious the big picture perspective of things. And when I see that you're from Malta, the first thing that comes to my mind is, oh, I wonder how many people you talk to know where Malta is. Cause I was a geography yeah. buff when I was young. And so I, yeah. I knew all the countries, but I imagine a lot of people don't know where it is. You're right. Some, some people do, but uh, the majority of people do not. I mean, it is a very, very small country. It is, uh, 17 miles is the longest distance one could travel in Malta. So <clears throat> I think they can be excused for not knowing where it is. Yeah. Incidentally, it, my, my origins lie in Malta. Both my parents were of Maltese origin, but I personally was born in Egypt. Okay. And my family were refugees from Egypt at the time of the Suez Canal crisis in 1956, when Egypt nationalized the Suez Canal and in response, the British and the French, who owned the canal, uh, responded by invading, basically, with a massive force. Right. This was condemned by the United Nations. The U.S. put tremendous economic pressure on Britain and France. And within a few days, they had to withdraw in, in, in something of a, a state of disgrace, shall we say. Okay. It was a big fiasco for, for Britain and France. And they had to take with them all their nationals. Now, the Maltese who had been born in Egypt had British passports, as a result of which the Maltese population were given, as with everyone else who was being expelled, we were given three days notice. My parents lost everything. The, oh, wow. You know, monies were frozen and they were never recovered. This, this involved 20,000 Maltese who were living in Egypt at the time. So we went to Britain as refugees. Interesting. By the way, your camera is shaking a little. I'm not sure why or how to fix that. I, I apologize for that. It is on my knees, so I will try and not uh, not shake quite so much. No, it's okay. I, I do the same. I do the same thing. Um, and then uh, you you did a lot of studying in in the UK, which I, I will not hold against you. Good. Uh, Cambridge and and Southampton and 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 bath and um and london uh, king's college london king's I college that was that's right king's college um is it do they approach science and chemistry a little different in the uk um, yes it's difficult to to explain just how but th there is definitely a difference in style for example i mean in one's earlier education when, at, at the age of about 15 to 16, a student in England has to make a choice between humanities and sciences. Okay. I happened to choose chemistry, physics, and mathematics for what are called the advanced levels, the A levels. Right. And so from there on, I did not study any humanities subjects. 
you didn't have to take humanities units at college. And so it's much more specialized. Uh, PhDs take three years rather than five or six as they do in the US. Okay. So there, there are differences. Now, at, at you, you were at a number of places. You were at, at, at Purdue. You were teaching a couple of places before you ended up at UCLA. It's very different from like, say, some people like Roald Hoffman was at Cornell for like 95 years, right? His whole, right. His whole life. You moved around, but it seems like you found a home at UCLA. Right. Well, you can't beat the weather in California. I wouldn't want to live in Ithaca, upstate New York. Yeah, so I, I, I know the, the both worlds very well because I was born in upstate New York and grew up there. And now, as you know, I live not too far from you in California. Yeah. So I agree, but there seems to be a small holdout of people who really like yeah. Ithaca and the hot, <laughs> sticky summers and the cold winters. Exactly. But plus the fact that UCLA is an excellent school. Um, there's no, <laughs> no denying it. So, uh, yeah, I, I've now, this is my, I've just completed 21 years, which feels like a lifetime at UCLA. So it's, it's funny to hear someone say that I've jumped around because although I did initially, you know, 21 years in one place is, is quite amazing for me. Yeah, 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 it's, 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 it's pretty good. You, you have a position of, of instructor. You don't have to run like a big research group and right. study organom. It's, I feel like that's a very rare position. I feel like usually the instructors are like new PhDs and like the plum position is to run a research group. But you seem to have like, be, you're one of the most established professors at UCLA, but you, um, you managed to be an instructor and then have time to write the books and right. do other things. Uh, is, that, is that pretty rare, would you say, in academia? Um, yes and no. I, I mean, it, it's partly because of my research interests. My, as you know, I'm interested in history and philosophy of chemistry, history and philosophy of science generally. And there aren't that many grants in that area. And so um, I'm not in a position to run a big research group. Okay. Uh, um, I, I sometimes jokingly say that I'm hiding out in the chemistry department at UCLA because I don't do real chemistry. I don't do hands-on chemistry. I right. do history of chemistry, philosophy of chemistry. And for my sins of being interested in such abstract areas, I teach a great deal of general chemistry, which I love doing, by the way. I, I, I find it very philosophical. Uh, and, and I like to say that if someone's teaching chemistry, they, they can't help but be philosophical about what they're doing. They have to think about the subject right. in, a, in, a, in a deeper way. So given all that, you know, that's, that's where I've ended up and um, I'm happy with it. But, but you don't only teach general chemistry, right? I think I've seen like seven or eight different classes you've, ta you've, ta you've taught some of the more um, advanced chemistry. I do teach, I do teach a class in uh, history and philosophy of science as well, in, which is open to the, to the whole university. It's an, it, we call them honors collegium classes here at UCLA. Okay. So humanities students can, will take them as much as science students. Your general chemistry class gets a lot of medical and that pre-medical and pre-dental students, right? Yes, yes, although we have two streams. We have the general chemistry for the science majors, uh, science and engineering majors, and we have the biological science majors stream. And of course, the biological science major stream is, oh, let's say 70 to 80% pre-meds. Right, I think I've seen your name on the life science stream class. I teach both. Those students are under a lot of pressure to get an A and to move on. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Their life depends upon it. Right, and um, 
your class some people uh some people don't like it's that it's not super easy it's uh some well, people think it's a it's a little it's it's not a cakewalk it, not a cakewalk well you know i it's ucla um nothing is going to be a cakewalk at ucla i, I don't think it's just my classes yeah <laughs> I uh, I was just looking at some of the review sites, and I think it's the nature of the review that when people go and they find out they actually have to work for a grade, I think a lot of these students might want to like they're trying to plan out their year and how can they get a four zero and how can they optimize getting in the yeah. medical school and um so which is a, which is a pity because some of them show real interest and promise in in basic science in chemistry in, in my case and i sometimes wish some of them were not so hell-bent on following a medical career of course we need x number of medics every year but um, this drive toward that you, you know we you must do medicine is i think a little exaggerated well it's a little self-correcting because not all of them will make it to medical school and they will be forced to choose something else at the yes. end of four years. Well, I would like to think that it's not just the ones who can't make it into medicine <laughs> that end up going into chemistry and physics and, and pure biology research. Yeah. Uh, if that's the case, well, the real talent is going only into medicine. Yep. I, mean, I like to tell them to pursue what really interests them. Be, right. You know what they have a passion for, and if they find they have a passion for chemistry, then pursue chemistry, pursue physics, uh, because they're going to be doing this for a long time, and they had better really enjoy it instead of doing something because they think they have to do it. Now, when you were young, I know that you were better at chemistry than than hum definitely humanities and probably also physics, but did you also have a passion for it as much as you were better at it? Did they did they go together or did? Now that's an interesting question. As a matter of fact, I regretted giving up the humanities in the way that I said I did in England. I had to make that choice. And I went for chemistry, physics and mathematics because it was challenging, because it was interesting, because it was absorbing. But I regretted leaving behind the history, the geography, the foreign languages and so on. And right. in a strange kind of way, they came back to me later on when I started writing books and, you know, addressing the general public in some of my books. Right. Um, so it, uh, it, it has a funny way of not really leaving you if you have a, an early interest in something. And you also kept up with your guitar hobby. Oh, yes. Yes, that's the main reason why I came to the United States, of course. Interesting. Yeah, I, I love blues guitar. Blues guitar went through something of a of a boom in, in Britain in the late 60s, early 70s. But then people seem to lose interest, well, many of them. And uh, whereas the States was, of course, the home of the blues, it, it, it's never waned in interest here. And so that's one of the reasons, and, and I say this quite seriously, why I actually came to the States for the, for the music, for the blues and the jazz and the funk and the rock and roll. Well, I think you and I have something in common. I also play guitar as a hobby, and one of my favorite guitarists to learn and play his music is Eric Johnson. Oh, wow, well, yeah. Fabulous guitar player. Yeah, I, I listen to his music all the time. Yeah, really intricate, really sort of intellectual playing. So and, um, and of course, <laughs> go on. No, no, go ahead. I, I was just going to name a few other guitar heroes, but yeah, Eric Clapton, BB King, Freddie King, Albert King, all those guys, tremendous players. And I, I fell in love with it at the age of about 15, just copying them to begin with, as one does to learn these, this kind of music. Yeah. It's not written and it's just, it's just improvisational music. So how, how does one convince 
a university like UCLA that you want to be a professor there, you want to teach, but you also want some time to write, write these books. Like, do they need convince? Do you just need to get grants for it? Like, how does that process happen? Well, the, the writing of books came later, actually. I mean, I, I was hired to teach large general chemistry classes. Right. And as a result, you know, I wasn't on, I'm still not on too many committees. I don't have the kind of responsibilities you've mentioned earlier of having to lead a, a research team. And so that gave me the spare time to publish articles in history and philosophy of science journals right. and to begin on the idea of, of uh, writing a, a book about the periodic table. Because strangely enough, even though the periodic table is so central in chemistry, it seems that few people have been attracted to writing books on the subject. There are one or two, but surprisingly few, which was good for me when I, when I decided to do this. And, and one of those is in a foreign language, right? One of those uh, two other books. Which one are you th thinking about? Um, I think it's in German. It's, I saw yeah. you in two of them that you really had noticed when you first started on your book and one of them was in German. Oh yeah, yeah, thank you for the, for reminding me. Yes, it's a, it's a rather old book of 1900 or something when, before the advent of quantum mechanics that, okay. you know, revolutionized our understanding of the periodic table. Right. Um, but yeah, the, um, the periodic table, its story and, and significance, um, it's, uh, it's, when did that first come out? 2009, 2010? 2007. 2007. Okay. And then you made a shorter version of it, right? For more of the general public, like a mini version. Yes. It's called a, a very short introduction very to short the period introduction, sort of hitting the highlights of it. Yeah, yeah, it's part of that VSI series that Oxford University Press puts out. There are now over four hundred titles on anything you care to mention, from Karl Marx to Buddhism to uh, terrorism to you name it. Yeah. It's an excellent, excellent series. The 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 I mean, there's. For me, someone who just has such a passion for the periodic table and the elements, and I'm still, I think, catching up to a lot of people and, and learning the history and some of these relationships. The thing that struck me the most was Henry, Henry Mosley uh -huh. and just how important he was to all of chemistry and science and just allowing us to have a way to just identify this is an element or it's not that just has so yeah. many ramifications right correct yes yes um yes and and ye yes and no i would i would say because for, for example you may know that as a result of mosley's work and the his discovery that atomic number rather than atomic weight is is a more correct criterion right. for ordering the right. elements. The number of electrons. That only makes a difference in four instances in the periodic table. There are just four pair reversals. It's tellurium and iodine is one of them, right? It is the well-known one. That's the well-known one. Right. Um, argon and potassium is another one. Okay. And cobalt, uh, what is it? Nickel and chromium or cobalt and chromium. Uh, cobalt is one of them. So, but interestingly, at the time of when of the discovery of the periodic table, there were only two such pair reversals. The other two have involved elements that were only discovered a lot later. Uh, so it was not a threat to the periodic table. Right. Yeah. I guess I guess I think about didn't he invent that um, device that uses X rays to be able to you could see the yeah. wavelengths and you can identify. Like, is yes. this a, a new element or is this just simply a mix of rare earth elements? Exactly, exactly. So in that respect, it was tremendously useful. Yeah, the x spectrum could be used to identify whether it was this or that element, as you say, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me that, that really, because you have all these people who are claiming they're discovering elements, they're, 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 they're claiming this and that, and 
um, you know, it, it's interesting because um, his his uh, his device allowed some people who thought they discovered an an, an element. Um, well, what's what's uh, what's his name? Uh, Urbane. Yeah. Urbane thought he had something and he didn't. And he strikes me as someone who really wanted to discover an element. Like, yeah. but I think he discovered others. But he, he, the one you're referring to is the element that became known as hafnium. Yeah. It turns out it was not hafnium. Incidentally, I have I have a book all about this. It's called A Tale of Seven Elements. Seven Elements, right. Hafnium is one of the two non-radioactive elements out of the seven. Right. It's the seven elements that were discovered following Mosley's discovery. Hafnium, rhenium, promethium, protractinium, technetium, Good. francium, astatine. Am I remembering Excellent. them all? Excellent. So you remember them much far better than I could have done. <laughs> now, interesting. I don't believe Even that. Though he, even though Mosley's x-ray technique was available, it's quite amazing how the disputes were not simply resolved. You, know, you might think, well, you just look at the x-ray spectrum and you can settle the, uh, these questions of priority and these questions of whether it's that element or not. But remarkably enough, these disputes persisted. Some of them persist to this day. For instance, there's a, there's a Japanese professor who has recently been trying to rehabilitate the discovery of, now let me see if I can remember which particular, rhenium. Right. He claims that a fellow Japanese of, uh, who was working with Ramsey back in 1907 discovered an element which he named nipponium. Okay. Which he was deprived of because people said, no, no, that's not really an element. But these modern attempts are aimed at saying that that really was a sample of what turned out to be rhenium. Interesting. And the debate is ongoing. It still has not been settled. Now, speaking of discovering and naming elements, if I remember correctly, someone named an element after Mosley that wasn't really an element, and now he can no longer have an element named after him, which seems a little strange. Oh, yes, I agree. I was part of a campaign not long ago where we even wrote to the Times of London saying, look, the, these, the, it was when the four elements, the latest four elements had been discovered. Right. And we were saying, well, never mind that rule. We really feel that Mosley should be granted an element. And of course, we were ignored by UPAC and um, they went ahead and named the elements in the way they wanted to name them. Yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's a pity that there, that there is that rule that if an element has been named and turns out to be retracted, one can never use that. And, and strangely enough, though, Nipponium seems to be an exception to that rule because there right. is now an, an element named Nihonium, which right. amounts to almost the same thing. And yet that element back in 1907 was named Nipponium. So even, even that rule hasn't been applied consistently. So if they want to change the rule, how many people are there like on this committee that votes on this at, at UPAC? I, I don't know the number, but it's an intricate organization which proceeds extremely cautiously. Right. Uh, as you may know, I've been involved in, a, in, a, in an issue involving group three of the periodic table. Right, right. Now, uh, yeah, that's ongoing as well. That's the um, one where you you made the the you filed the paper in 2015 and like six years later they gave you an answer, <laughs> or they, they gave, gave me a what? Follow up. A follow up. Well, they named me chair of the the working group. That's right. To investigate this, and we've been investigating this, and I recently published an article with the conclusions from that. So it it it's still pe people have very very strong views on elements as you know they have very strong views on the periodic table and so th these are controversial issues and i suppose upac has to proceed cautiously they don't want to be in a in a situation similar to the pluto affair that the astronomers dealt with right. where they they excluded pluto and there was a public um huge public reaction 
right. saying that they shouldn't have done that. They love I their nine the planets. Was, I think the caution is for reasons of that kind. Is it, it's over a thousand different periodic tables have been published, right? Yes, yes. I've seen in some of your videos, you have a lot of different models of like a spiral and a pyramid yeah. and... Actually, just there, you might be able to see uh, there's a sort of three-dimensional periodic table. Which I see it, I see it a little bit. Things. Yeah, people send them to me and, and I collect them and yeah, my website is full of such uh, such wonders. <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you think the world is ready for it? I, I feel like 99% of what we deal with is 2D, like on a screen, on a paper, on a book. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced of the added value of going three-dimensional, although there are some, uh, some advantages. For example, uh, you may know that in the short form table, the eight column table, the original tables tended to be eight columns. They were able to line up elements that had a common valence. For instance, boron, aluminum, and scandium, right. and oh, yet plus three. were all in one column. We have lost that in moving to the 18 column table, right. such as the one shown behind you. The three dimensional tables, some of them at least, are able to recapture that connection. Okay. By taking a slice through instead of a column, one takes a, a kind of a slice, a plane through. I'm thinking of Fernando Dufour's three dimensional Christmas tree periodic table. Okay. So, yes, but it's not going to, it, it would be difficult for textbooks unless you had a pop up version where you open the book and the three dimensional table pops up. It doesn't lend itself to textbooks. It doesn't lend itself um, to wall charts. And I feel like the classic science classroom has to have a a big poster of a sure. periodic table. So, sure. but it wouldn't hurt to have a few 3D periodic tables lying around to excite the student interest, to show the student that the, there yeah. are many facets, literally facets, yeah. to this whole question. There's, there's three changes that you've, you've contemplated and, and maybe not recommended, but that like stick out to me. And one is moving hydrogen. Should we move hydrogen to the top of the, the halogens? Yeah. And one is moving helium to the alkaline earth to the top there. And then the third, which I know you're a proponent of, is um, in the third group, um, taking out, I think, yttrium, I think you're moving in like lutetium and lorentium. Lorentium and lutetium to be removed from group three to yeah. be replaced by lutetium and lorentium. Yeah. 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 Well, well what about the other, what about the first two? Okay. I did toy with the idea of putting hydrogen into the halogens. I'm not the first to do that. Many, many people have considered it. There are some obvious advantages to doing that. Hydrogen is a diatomic gas, as is fluorine, as is chlorine. Hydrogen is not a metal unless you go to the center of Jupiter, and even then we don't really know. Yeah. So to put it into group one may appear to be a bit of a stretch. These days I've abandoned that idea. Okay. Helium in group two, however, <clears throat> I think is a correct move, even though chemically speaking, in terms of properties, it right. seems improbable because helium, as you know, is an extremely inert. In fact, it's right. possibly the most inert of all gases. So to put it into a column along with magnesium and calcium and barium seems strange. However, in the so-called left step periodic table, which was first proposed back in the 1920s by a French engineer, his name is Janet, Charles Janet. It, it fits perfectly into, into group two, helium that is. Okay. And the periodic table one obtains is extremely regular and it does, to some of us at least, it suggests that it might be more correct if one can even say that about a periodic table. Sure. There are endless debates about whether one can really speak of there being a, a more correct periodic table. Some people have argued that they want to maximize the number of, of triads Yes. Right. Yes. 
Um, that's the argument I gave for putting hydrogen in the halogens. Okay. And I think, I think one has to be a bit careful on that. I've actually backtracked on that particular one. But incidentally, if one does put helium into group two, it doesn't so much maximize the number of triads, but it regularizes the triads in the following way. At the moment in the periodic table, such as the one you have behind you, yeah. the first member of any triad, now let, let, let me just get this absolutely right, because it's a little complicated to just say in words without pointing to diagrams uh, and so on. Is it Prout that started this? Uh, no, it was Doberiner who okay. started triads. Um, there's, there's a thing called first member anomaly. As it stands, not all the groups have triads such that the first member is anomalous. If you put helium in group two, helium is clearly the first member of that group and very, very anomalous because it's so unlike beryllium and magnesium and so on. Right. right. And whereas at the moment, it is not particularly anomalous. Helium and neon are both highly unreactive. In fact, there's some evidence that shows that neon is the most react unreactive of the noble gases. Okay. So it's more complicated than just maximizing triads. I, I like to call it regularizing triads. The left step periodic table completely regularizes these um, relationships having to do with first member anomaly. And first member anomaly is generally accepted. You know, in, in any group of the periodic table, right. you just have to look and you see the tremendous difference between the first member and subsequent members. Yep. So it's a combination of that and triads, which is yet another uh, reason why one might want to switch to the left step periodic table. Yeah, I mean, carbon is quite different than than the rest of the, the members of that group. And we all know it's the basis of life. And I, I've, I've heard, uh, you know, I've seen your interview with one of your students, also Eric. Yeah. He asked you about silicon life forms and maybe there's a situation where silicon does well. But, you know, I feel like we, we have the ability to put things under extreme heat, extreme cold, extreme pressure, right? and yeah. that a vacuum and if if silicon all of a sudden formed all these these polymers and bonds and i feel like we would have we would have seen it so i feel like if if there is a scenario where, where silicon can create life it would have to be something that beyond our capability of creating the the, the environment you know the condition right, right. Because yes, the, the, laws of, the laws of nature would have to be very, very different in other parts of the universe to really see silicon life. Yeah, I mean, the, the laws of nature, I mean, the laws of physics would have to be the same. I don't know. We can, we can create a lot of different conditions here, but anything's possible. But I feel like the more we're able to create different conditions that exist on other planets, the more improbable it gets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, the catenation property that seems to be lacking in silicon, at least right, silicon, right. silicon. Yeah. Right, I mean, it's, I mean, it can do a little bit. I mean, you know, when you have silicates, there's, you know, how many different silicate ions are there? There's like thousands, right? Like. You never really know how many silicons and oxygens you have when you create a silicate. Yeah, and it prefers to form silicon oxygen bonds than to form silicon silicon bonds. So right there, it uh, it seems to suggest that you're not going to get an organic chemistry based on silicon. And I feel like silicon dioxide, it's sort of like titanium dioxide. They're both dead ends, right? Once you end up with titanium dioxide or silicon dioxide, you need like the power of the world to transform it into something else. It just yeah. does not want to react yeah. with anything except for hydrofluoric. 
I, I know you pointed out that silicon and titanium have some similar properties. I mean, I know titanium tetrachloride is sort of covalent and um, hydrofluoric acid is really one of the only things that will react with either of those dioxides. Yes, yes. That comes back to that idea of in the old eight column periodic tables, those two elements were in the same column because of their valence of four. Yeah, but there's so many differences. I mean, yeah. they look nothing alike. I mean, right. silicon and selenium, on the other hand, you know, they, they look a lot more similar. I mean, titanium compounds are colored, silicon's not. So there's yeah. a lot of differences. Yeah. But um, although aren't some titanium compounds uh, white, and as in t uh, titanium in paints? Sure, in the in the plus four state. Yeah, yeah. But like, once you like get to electrons. plus two and plus three, it gets pretty nice. Yeah. yeah. I see you really know your chemistry, Scott. I mean, I think that you know the chemistry of colors and smells i mean i think it's there's there's a, a lot of people that it's it's fascinating right i mean you can do so much with it and make so many different things and you don't need a million dollars of equipment to do it right yeah and um i think that you know when i was growing up there's a lot of people who really was fascinated by the fact that you could make things and you never were really sure what you're going to make depending on the conditions and maybe you're making something that no one else you've ever met has made or people haven't made in 30 years it's it's quite you know i just i yeah i've always been fascinated with it and especially transition yes. metals like if you think about all the possible compounds you could make with it it's it's unlimited almost right it's absolutely really, right yeah, and all those colors, and sometimes subsequent color changes, just on on changing the reagent, on adding more or less reagent. But it's not just colors; it's texture and behavior. So, for example, if you have neodymium nitrate, and you want to make some different precipitates, you can make neodymium phosphate or carbonate and hydroxide, and they're very hard to tell apart. They're all gelatinous. They're all this lilac purple color in, in sunlight. Yeah. But when you go and you make say neodymium ferrous cyanide, it, it's the precipitate falls, rains down hard. It's like, it's this really heavy molecule that just drops down to the bottom of the test tube. And it's, it's, looks almost unlike any other precipitate I've ever seen. It's just so beautiful and it's this really nice white. And then you have neodymium chromate, yeah. the opposite. It has this unique property where it actually sticks to the glass, where it just won't come off. And it's this brilliant yellow. And it's there's all these things that you just can't describe it by the color because when you look at it, you see that they move differently they they coagulate differently it's yeah it's interesting really oh, I was, i'm not familiar with the, those reactions i'd love to see them i hope you have videos of that somewhere i i, I actually have a video of all those on youtube of everything i uh talked about Good. i'll send you a link um i just you know i love the idea of you have this element that not a lot of people know about and let's just Let's just see what happens when you try to create these these different yeah. compounds and see what it's like. And that's that's a sense of exploration. And I think a lot of people had in organic chemistry in the early 20th century, but it's it's almost it's a lost art. It's losing out to social media and video games and Twitter and so sure. well, of course, chemi chemistry sets are almost illegal these days. Almost, but I mean, you know, I've I've put together my own quite lab quite easily. So you can't 
order a kid's chemistry set, but if you want to put together yourself, at least in the US, it's still it's still quite easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you you mentioned one time a long time ago that people should try to experience the colors and the smells and explosions of chemistry. I don't remember. You yeah, said. yeah. I think I was making a, a point about chemical education. And more and more, the tendency is to put the atomic physics and the quantum and mechanical concepts first. Right. And that's what it was. Now, I love that stuff, of course, the, the quantum mechanics and the orbitals and the wave functions and so on. But unt until the student has actually developed a feel for chemistry, uh, that stuff can be rather off-putting. So it's, it's like putting the cart before the horse. So interesting you said that. That is pretty much exactly what our Chem Talk is all about, our mission and program. I think we yeah. started because myself and hundreds of other college students that we've interviewed or have worked with us or we've surveyed have said that exact same thing that yes chemistry is hard but it's it's you need to show people the really exciting things first and get them to want to do the quantum mechanics not shove that at them first and say oh okay later on you get to see this um I know a long time ago, I saw a video of, of you had this very large elephant toothpaste demonstration uh, yeah. with all the foam. Now, I have, I actually, I, I think elephant toothpaste is interesting just because of um, the different kind of catalysts you can use with hydrogen peroxide and the fact that some of them are catalysts and some aren't. Like manganese dioxide is a catalyst because it does not change but potassium permanganate is not a catalyst because it actually reacts and it, it gets reduced to manganese plus two, which then further plus four, which then further catalyzes the reaction. I don't know if you remember what you used in your... Uh, I think it was bromide ions in the form of potassium bromide. We ah. put it in liquid form and we throw in some crystals as well. It and you probably used a green food coloring because it was green. <laughs> Yes, just to give it a bit of color. I mean, I don't think that catalyzes anything. But and maybe you are using. I'm going to guess thirty percent hydrogen peroxide. Oh, I, something like that. I don't remember the uh, the percentage. Because based on the percentage and the catalyst, you get a very different amount of of foam coming out. And you had yeah. quite a, a good amount. And then I saw you blowing the foam at, at students. So I'm like, okay, whatever's in there is relatively non toxic. Uh -huh. But starch is definitely not a strong enough catalyst to, to do that. But bromide yeah. is perfect. Bromide yeah. is, is relatively benign, but it's um, if it's anything like iodide, it gives quite a good rate of reaction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great demonstration. Um, I like to incorporate demonstrations into lectures, especially lectures of 350 or so students, which otherwise can get uh, yeah. a little bit dry. So what, what we're doing is we are doing research on what kinds of experiments can kids, can students be more hands-on with where it's not just the teacher showing them, but it's safe enough where they could do it themselves in school and then eventually even make kits that yeah. teachers, I mean, you have access to a large number of resources, but not everyone does. So you can imagine a kit that has like copper sulfate, tin chloride, where you can create tin crystals, do a simple elephant toothpaste, um, something with gallium and show how combining with aluminum, it will allow aluminum to release hydrogen from water. Yeah. Like there's, there's, um, there's a lot of things that people can do hands on that will really get them excited about chemistry. I think it's all about supplement, right? I, I feel like the whole industry of chemistry and teaching it just needs a supplement to give people this little extra boost of interest. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think it's a great thing you're doing. And it's, it is very, very much lacking. And the, the move towards putting principles first seems to be intensifying. There are books now 
that pride themselves on this. They call themselves atoms first approach, which is all about atomic physics and quantum chemistry. And, and there really is very little chemistry there. Mm. It becomes sort of exercises in writing out the electronic configuration of any particular element. Right. And, you know, back when the, the periodic table was being developed, you had a lot of different teams working on it independently, right? And Mendeleev had this, this idea that, okay, let's not just de look at them as isotopes, as simpler substances, but let's also look at them as, you know, real elements, basic, basic substances, right? Yeah. And I feel like, I feel like that there's a large advantage when you have these independent teams, each, each, each working themselves and you have the best of all the ideas. Yeah. And you see that also in, in technology and startups, you see Facebook, Google, all these companies competing with each other, with each other. Sometimes I feel like industry and academia and the National Science Foundation and the American Chemical Society. I mean, these are all great long institutions with a large history, but sometimes they almost act like one enormous mass, like one enormous amoeba that moves slow and mm -hmm. has one train of thought. So my proposal is that chemistry will be better served if in addition to this large body of thought that, that moves together, you have more of a, a grassroots independent, um, you know, bottom up, like where it's from, it's, it's students, high school and college students right. who say, who are really driving it. And maybe you put one tenth of a percent of all the chemistry educations in the world towards this group. So you can name it Chem Talk. You can have myself. You can have someone else run it. You can change our mission. But I think the thing that I'm trying to sell people on is first you need to buy into the concept that it's positive hmm. to have another train of thought, right? Like maybe they'll come up with something different. Like you need to believe in that. Otherwise, like you just say, no, just have one large group do all the thinking, but that has downsides, right? Like. Definitely, definitely. It lacks originality for once. There's so many barriers. There's so many review processes that yeah. some of the great ideas may be killed off before they, they yeah. reach maturity. Yeah, and the way you're talking, it, it strikes me that more and more that sort of grassroots uh, behavior is, is becoming more and more influential. I'm thinking of the, the recent business in, on the stock exchange where, mm -hmm. where people who are just uh, amateurs if, on the stock market, if you like, I mean, they, they probably hate to be called amateurs, but you know what I mean. And they actually had a, a profound influence on certain shares. Yeah. Um, so, so grassroots is, uh, is back in vogue and is be, being recognized more and more. So in, in that respect, yes, I, I, can, I can now understand better what it is you're trying to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to yeah. say that this this vehicle has value, yeah. and that you don't have to you don't have to say okay we, this is a perfect vehicle right now. But if you agree in the concept in in the vehicle, then then I would say then let's let's shape it, let's make it the best vehicle possible, and figure out what's what's most important. Oh. Um, yeah. But we're we're taking a first stab at it. But the idea is is to get input and buy in. Yes. And, you know, people can help steer this vehicle as much as they want. They can help a little. They can say we support it yeah. or people can get, you know, because there's a lot of steering wheels in this vehicle that no one is is at yet. You know, we, we've occupied a few, but it's like barely left the, the starting gate. Right. Yeah. So. Good. So it can have a life of its own, an organic growth type, type of thing. I, I, I feel like if you want to get to the best possible outcomes, you, you want to have, you want to have evolution, right? You want to have different, different organic growth, right? And this is an organic growth that I think will add a, a lot of value, especially since, I mean, technology has changed a lot with social media, with video and um, younger people, they understand that they understand 
that science is important. They understand how people learn. And, um, you know, they have a lot of great ideas for what will get people excited about it. And the alternative is that the people who will really excited about science, like someone like Oliver Sacks, who was really passionate, he collected yeah. elements, he wrote a book on Uncle Tungsten about it, but now he, yeah. he's not alive, like he's dead. And at some point, are all these people going to be so old that there's no one left to carry it on? Right. I knew, I knew Oliver quite well. I mean, I knew him for about 20 years. He first, uh, he came to my notice. I was on my way to uh, UC San Diego to give a lecture. And when I arrived, I was handed an article from the New York Times, which he had written about, I think, Humphrey Davy. Yep. I read and so that. I started a correspondence with him and it kept going for, as I say, about 20 years. Um, when, I, when I finally met him, we did the, the thing of, getting our wallets out of our pockets and showing the other person that we both carry the periodic table round in our wallets. <laughs> yeah, he was, he's wonderful and his books are fabulous. He, he fell in love with the periodic table that was in the Science Museum in London. Okay. And he and I both regretted very much when that periodic table was torn down and replaced with something else. I think it was a, a biological cell which right, different right. light up if you pressed a certain button. But um, I even tried to find out what had, what had happened to that uh, periodic table. And apparently it's, it, it's somewhere in the back rooms of the Science Museum in London. Mm. So changing topics for a moment, you were part of a PBS series called Mystery of Matter, right? Yes. So I, I haven't been able to watch this, but tell me like what, what was it and, and what was your involvement? And then I'll tell you why I'm asking. Sure, um, it, it was 10 years in the making and, and I think it, it is really high quality television. Uh, it was Nova who were the ones who, who put it together. I was one of two historical consultants and I was also interviewed in the, the course of the, the three, it's three episodes. And it basically follows the discovery, the history of the discovery of the elements. Okay. And it, it, it and it's, it's also dramatized. So it's like a docudrama okay. where they have people in period piece costumes portraying uh, Lavoisier and his wife working in the laboratory. And you have Mosley making yeah. his discovery. You have Humphrey Davy jumping around with joy when he first produces potassium in his lab through the electrolysis experiment and, and right, right up to modern times of Glenn Seaborg, the first to synthesize elements like um, um, Neptunium, although I think somebody else, what's the one after Neptunium? Plutonium is Seaborg's yeah. famous one, the first of 10 elements at least. So it's, uh, it's great television. It's absolutely wonderful television. It brings everything to life. And it's accurate. So that's that's the difference between this and so many other science shows that sort of take shortcuts and uh, and simply want to appeal to the popular imagination. This does both. And what year was this filmed? Oh, it was filmed over something like 10 years and it's been out now for about five or six years. Okay. It's available on the internet, free of charge. I'll have to watch it. I know that World Hoffman also had a, a, a series from much longer ago where he taught chemistry, yeah. and talked about chemistry, and they made it a whole series. Yes. You can't even find it really online anymore. It's not even accessible. And one of my worries is that I feel like every year that goes by, the appetite and desire to, to do things in media with chemistry and science is less and less. Yeah. Um, I feel like things are changing so fast that I, I worry if there's going to be continued appetite for for these kinds of things. And I want to, you know, we want to do something about that and reverse that that thinking. Yeah. Um, Plus the fact that chemistry gets a bad rap in all of uh, popularization of science in general. Physics, of course, is is very popular because it's so dramatic and it deals with 
with the edge of the universe, black holes, Big Bang, and, and biology is of course of great interest because it's about life and chemistry that's supposed to be the central science and is the central science sort of misses out in the popularity stakes. I think if, if, if you show people like amazing reactions and experiments and these colors and crystals, I mean, I, I think that people would, would realize it, but, you know, instead of focusing on teaching them right up front about the, the atom, there's, I mean, right. you know, there's just, even the fact that you have some of that gallium that can melt in your hand, like, yeah, that's really amazing. And most people don't even know that. Like, I think it's part of it is just marketing. Like nobody has really marketed chemistry. Yeah. That. So you, said you had a reason for asking about the mystery of matter series. Are, are you planning a documentary series, perhaps? I, 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 I just think that we need to make a conscious effort to try to get chemistry back in the limelight. And that's part of chem talk. And if you, if, if no one does anything, then it's going to become less and less um, feasible. I think, I think at a minimum, like something like mystery of matter could be promoted better. And chem talk is designed to be a vehicle to, uh, if you look at, at, at most science productions and interviews and something like this, it has not been promoted on YouTube, on social media. I mean, most things probably has very little views. I yeah. think that, um, you know, you need a team of people, young people who really understand the internet and social media, who knows how to show things. I mean, we had, we had an experiment showing that if you, you drop a piece of zinc into a acidified tin two chloride solution, you yeah. get this beautiful growth of tin crystals around it. It's really stunning. Yeah. And the other day, and that got 150,000 views on oh. TikTok the other day, 150,000. Yeah. I wouldn't even know how to use TikTok. I do my best on Facebook and Twitter, but beyond that, um, you're right. The young people are the ones who know how to navigate those. I don't, I don't either, but we have people in high school and college managing these things and, and they get yeah. it and they know how to, yeah. how to, how to reach people. So um, yeah. that's what I was asking. I, I'd love to watch this and, and get it viewed by more people because I would guess that most people don't even know it exists, but I do think I that if they want to make it interesting, this is just some dark humor, but Lavia Sear was executed in the 1700s, right? Yeah. In France, was it guillotine or beheaded? Yes, it was, it was. Yeah. That's dramatic. And then you have Mosley, he was killed at age 27 by a Turkish sniper in World War right. I. That's right, that's right. So there's a lot of ways to make that film full yeah. of, of drama. Yeah. Another episode in, in that uh, series is the Curie husband and wife team uh, who discovered, as you know, radium and polonium. Right. And of course, there's a lot, there's a lot that could be done with the, those characters. I mean, they had radium on them all the time, right? I mean, I think they carried it in their pockets. Yeah. I think they used to have glow in the dark clocks and they still, they're still out there. I think they're made with radium bromide, isn't that? I think so, yeah. And the, the ladies who, who painted that on, it was recommended to them that they should lick the brush first because it would make for a finer point on the brush. Can you imagine? I mean, it's tragic. Yeah, that's too bad. I really, I want to do some experiments with uranium chemistry. It's, it looks so amazing. I mean, uranium has so many colors and oxidation states, but um, I really need a proper environment to do it because you don't want to have that in your body, right? You don't want to have that right. inhaled and the, your, um, the, you, you, you can't have any, any sloppiness that you can just working with more harmless things, so. Yeah. But 
some of these thorium is another element that has some really interesting chemistry. Yes. So, um, so six, quite a few number of people worked on developing the periodic table, right? But Mendeleev gets all the credit. He, he marketed himself the best. Is that what happened? It, it's partly that. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure he gets all the credit, but he certainly gets a, a major part of the credit. And mainly because he made predictions of elements that have not yet been discovered. And even more important, the predictions came out correctly. Anyone can make predictions. What's his, what's his batting average? Isn't it like nine out of 18 he got it's right? It's nine out of 18, which in itself does not speak very highly for his predictions. But certainly the first three or four predictions, but the first three he made, uh, scandium, gallium, and germanium okay. came out almost completely as he had predicted. Right. And so, you know, for the people who, who put a lot of uh, credit on making correct predictions, this, and, and, and of course we all do, you know, someone who can make correct predictions is almost uh, doing, performing magic. It's almost as if they, right. they can predict the future, al yeah. al almost literally. We don't have these elements and yet he knows their boiling points and melting points and right. colors. And, However, you know, the people who are able to come up with a consistent periodic table before him should be given far more credit. More recently, I've, been, I've, I've got into the habit of saying that it's almost as if Lothar Meyer, his closest competitor, discovered the periodic table and Mendeleev exploited the periodic table okay. better than anyone else. Discovery is a tricky concept. Yeah. You know, and the assignment of priority to one particular person is always complicated. It's really a gradual evolution, as I've argued in another book called The Tale of Seven Scientists. Yeah. It's not a case of one or two outstanding scientists doing all the work. It's, a, it's, a, it's back to the idea that you called an amoeba-like entity. Yeah. The scientific method is one giant organism in the way that I've described it. So before Mendeleev, you have hydrogen with an atomic weight of, of one or 1 1.00797, whatever it, is, whatever it is. It would have been one at the time. And helium of four. So you probably have these scientists thinking, okay, there must be more elements in between them. Yeah. But at some point they decided that, okay, we're going to order it by by atomic, atomic number, by the number of electrons. And was it, was it mostly that allowed them to make that shift? Um, no, there, there are various elements in what you've just said, if you forgive the pun. First of all, there's the fact that helium wasn't discovered until quite late on. Okay. Helium was discovered in the 1890s. So okay. it, it wasn't a problem. It, in fact, the gap was even bigger. The gap right. was between hydrogen and lithium. Right. One and seven. Right. So yeah, some people said there must there must be elements in between. There must be several. They probably thought there were several. Yeah. Yeah. And what else did you say? Because I, I did when when exactly did they realize that there's only one element between them? Um well I suppose Mosley would have would have made it categorical. But, you know, as a matter of fact, there was, there was never any serious suggestions of elements in between hydrogen and lithium that I'm aware of. You, okay. you, you raise a very interesting point. It's a very interesting point because other, in other places, one does simply look for gaps between atomic weights. And the argument is, well, if there's such a big gap, then there should be so many elements or at least one or two elements that you, you've given me something to work on. Okay. Because I know that historically, people did predict elements even before hydrogen. In fact, Mendeleev predicted as many as two or three elements. One of them is called Newtonium, the other one is called Coronium. But between hydrogen and helium, um, I'd like to look into that and get back to you. I think okay. there's a paper, that, there's an interesting paper there, because somebody should have worried about that problem. I, I feel like when I was researching this that I saw references to people 
thinking there was and okay. then realizing that once that you can define the elements by number of electrons and identify them that way using Mosley's x-rays technique, which yeah. interesting, I don't know if you knew this, but do you know that his technique used a crystal of potassium ferrocyanide? Yes, I did know that, yeah. That's one of my favorite compounds in the world, by the way, because you know, well, first of all, it 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 shows you that not everything is dangerous. People hear cyanide and think it's it's toxic, but you can eat it. Yeah. In fact, ferric ferrocyanide is on the WHO, the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines because uh -huh. of its ability to absorb thallium and cesium plus one ions. Okay. Again, I did not know that. Thank you. Um and in fact, I, I have this own personal project. I have this theory that the, you know, the ferrocyanide ion is really amazing because it, the structure can actually absorb other ions. So when you create a ferrocyanide precipitate, every time you create it, it's unique because it'll also absorb any other ions like sodium or potassium into the structure. I see. So, so when you actually get the precipitate, it, it, it has a lot more in it than, than you would, you would think. Um, I see. But ferrocyanide is, is a way that, you know, like how do you identify an element? Like it, it can be hard, right? To like really know what you have, but ferrocyanides I've noticed are very unique. The color, the consistency, like once you learn about ferrocyanides, I'd say more than almost any other ion. If you just give me an unknown element, unknown solution of an element, and I create the ferrocyanide, I could probably tell you what it what it is. Oh, okay. Which um, so I just I just find it interesting how it keeps coming up. But I I noticed that he used a crystal of that in. Yes. In his invention. Yes. When the, the popular story is that uh, Mosley discovered atomic number, but in fact, there was a Dutch economist called Van den Broek, who was the one who really thought up the idea of atomic number. He didn't do experiments in the way right. that, uh, that Mosley did. So Mo Mos again, it's a case of Mosley, if you like, exploited the idea or established yeah. it experimentally. But he didn't, he didn't dream up the idea. And in his papers, he actually gives credit to Van den Broek, and he says he set out to verify the hypothesis of Van den Broek, that atomic number would be a better ordering principle than atomic weight. So it's another of these cases of the little people who don't get enough credit in the history of science. Yeah, yeah all these people were really fascinated about order and classification, and that's that that's what you got you into the periodic table right you you really were drawn to ordering yeah. and classifying things i as a as a kid i collected uh, postage stamps that's a a form of classification you put them into countries first okay and then you put them into the sets and then you try and order them in the order of increasing currency value that's the atomic number in stamp collecting interesting so on so yeah I, I did I did a little bit of stamps. I did coins and I did rocks and minerals. I used to have pages and pages where I wrote out every mineral known and the formula and oh. I'd, I'd order them and same with stars and constellations. Yeah, I was, I was very much into into ordering. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the periodic table just shouts out order. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea that everything well almost everything right all all visible matter is comprised of these now 118 fundamental blocks it is it's is a powerful and fascinating idea and and i mean if you just think about science in general and what is is science it's science is something you can you can order, you can classify, you can say it's true or not, you can refute it or not refute it. Like that's sort of like 
what's Karl Popper's definition of science? Well, that one shouldn't try and prove a theory because it's impossible, but that one can, at least in principle, refute a theory. In other words, there's an asymmetry between proof and refutation. Refutation can be conclusive. It takes the observation of one black swan to refute the notion that all swans are white. Right. On the other hand, no piling up of white swans is ever going to prove that all swans are white because the very next one could be a different color. Yeah. So he, he exploits that asymmetry between proof or confirmation and disproof or refutation. It's, and it's a very powerful way to get at the difference between science and pseudoscience, for example. Yeah. Astrologers will make a prediction and they can always wriggle out of it. In other words, it's never really refutable. Right. Whereas science tends to be, there will be an element that has such and such a melting and boiling point. If it's not found, that person becomes history in the, in the pejorative sense of history. We never hear of them again. <laughs> Whereas the astrologer can say, ah, oh, well, you forgot to tell me that you have Mercury rising in your star chart. Had right. you told me that, then I would have got the prediction right. That's Popper's criterion for the demarcation between science and pseudoscience or non-science. Anytime I hear you say non-science, I'm, I'm waiting for you to make a joke and say, non call it nonsense. <laughs> oh, okay. Although Popper wouldn't want to say that the humanities are nonsense. They're non-science, but they're not nonsense. Right. Because, of course, in, in the humanities, one isn't dealing with refutable theories and concepts. I feel like even though it's science and it's facts and you can refute it or not refute it, we all have our own lens we look through, right? Like we all view... I mean, all these scientists, they had their own lenses and just the way that we, we think about chemistry and is it chemistry, is it physics, what's, what depends on each other? This all depends on our lens, right? Which to sure. me means if you have a lens, you have a philosophy, right? Like your own philosophy towards science dictates what lens you're using. Yeah, yeah. When I, when I, um, I know that one of your recent books is on the philosophy of, of chemistry and there's a couple people whose names we won't mention, like Peter Atkins, who's said negative things about philosophy. But when I look into him, he clearly has a philosophy. Like, and uh, Steven Weinberg, he's a physicist, right? Yes, he's another one who, who likes to say that philosophy is worthless in science. But if yeah. you look at his views, he clearly has his own philosophy. He has his own lens. He views things. So I just find it hypocritical that people who clearly have a philosophy towards how their own views. Yeah. Perhaps they mean professional philosophy of science, as opposed to having a philosophical outlook, which of course everyone has. But even I mean, then, I think professional philosophy of science can offer insights into the doing of science and interpreting what science is all about. But just to be you know, completely charitable to them, they are perhaps aiming their critiques at so-called professional philosophers of science, people who, who make a living out of it. I feel like when I was taught about the history of the world, like true civilization started when you had Greek philosophers like Aristotle and Plato like when man actually started thinking about the world. Like that's what yeah. I was taught civilization started. So to me, it's really important that you have people who are thinking about things that other people aren't. Like yeah. you have five or 10 billion people in the world. Okay, you need at least a few people to think about things. Otherwise, if no one is doing that, to me, that's, that's, that's bad. That's a negative. So, sure. um, I, I don't see a pro I, I, I think we need, you know, 
professional philosophers. I mean, we need a wide variety of, of people. I don't know why you would anyone would say you don't need you don't need that unless I mean you don't need millions of them, but you don't need everyone to be that. But right, right, um, and I suppose you don't need millions of chemists necessarily. No, but the world what? sort of has a way to work this out, right? I mean. And I, and I do believe that uh, professional philosophers of science have things to say about uh, chemistry and physics. Um, I, I belong to the sub-discipline of the philosophy of chemistry. I mean, that's been my, my other interest since, since day one, in a way, trying to reach a, a deeper understanding of chemistry. Instead of just doing chemistry, thinking about chemistry. Right. Unlike yourself, who you know, as a kid played with chemistry sets. I did a certain amount of that, but I was also always interested in what it meant, what it meant in the, in the general context of knowledge. Because chemistry is not just a way of producing new compounds for practical applications. It's an insight into the nature of the world. And that, that is a philosophical activity in itself. And there have been a number of instances where philosophers of chemistry, I believe have made specific contributions to the way chemists think about chemistry, think about quantum right. chemistry, for example. I think it's interesting how, I don't know when it was, at some point in your life, you you looked at, at Taoism, right? In Eastern philosophy. Yeah. And felt, no pun intended, an affinity towards um, how do you explain Taoism? It's like that the world is like unified, right? There's a natural order that there's a harmony and we should have a positive impact on the world. Um, now, it, the thing that drew me to the Eastern philosophical worldviews, all of them. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want to misrepresent Taoism, but that's why I'm sort of generalizing it. Yeah. Hinduism, Taoism, Zen, is their insistence or their, their emphasis they place on the unity of everything. Okay. And as far as I know, there's only one Western philosopher who's had, who's placed as much influence, uh, insistence on that concept, and that is Spinoza, okay. the early modern philosopher. I don't know him. Absolutely fascinating work in philosophy and he's well known in philosophy there's even some thoughts that he might have been influenced by eastern philosophy so i i my interest in many of these subjects is, is that i want to bring not just order into things but unity one of the things about the periodic table is it unifies everything yeah all the elements into one chart so similarly the discoveries in modern science and especially in physics have all been about unification, whether it be Faraday unifying magnetism and electricity, whether it be Weinberg and Salam, talking of Weinberg a moment ago, Weinberg and Salam, elect the electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force. And there's been a, a, you know, a sequence, Einstein unifying energy and matter. So unification is at the root of much, much of modern science. And that's that's one of the one of the qualities I've been interested in. Hmm. Interesting. I, I think for myself, I, I like the unity of the periodic table, but I'm also fascinated by the fact that, especially in the transition metals, you can have such extreme differences. Yes. I mean, you can have some compounds or elements that are just extremely inert you know, like zir zirconium or hafnium that it's just very difficult to get them to do anything then right. you have something like osmium and i mean look at the duality of osmium it's it's the densest element in the world i think it's like 22 grams per cubic centimeter yeah. But then if you if you if you burn it or heat it up and produce osmium tetroxide, it's it's an extreme toxin. Yeah. I mean, who would have guessed that 
based on periodic properties like yes you wouldn't so there's just there's so many fascinating things from a chemical perspective that yeah. i see that is just like wow there where did that come from right by the way i i think in saying that you've hit upon another concept in eastern philosophy which is yes there is an emphasis on unity but there's also the the idea of the the juxtaposition of diversity and unity so unity being what sort of sustains or supports the tremendous diversity that we have right before us and so it's the the coexistence of opposites is of course another important theme in eastern philosophy which is something that's actually absent as far as i know in western philosophy in western philosophy it's, it's either one thing or the other and it's regarded as paradoxical that one can have complete diversity and at the same time absolute unity that's hard to fathom in in a more rational way of thinking to the eastern philosophical mind that's that's fine you don't you don't find that a problem in other words yeah i i also find the rare earths fascinating like most people in chemistry that that whole series of elements is glossed over that you're just told that they're all similar they're hard to separate yeah there's not much interesting going on but when you really start looking at each element you find that they're very different and they they have some some have very unique optical properties some have very unique absorption spectrums yeah some of them create extremely colorful compounds in, in the right yeah. situation like samarium is this dull yellow the compounds but in certain situations you can create bright red and green compounds right. in plus two oxidation state yeah europium is another one i believe that uh, that does nice colors which one europium europium yeah, yeah europium is another one that has a plus two state yeah. Um, I have, I think I have some europium here. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty, I do. I need to explore that chemistry. We just, uh, put up a video on that. I made where you, you drop hydrochloric acid onto samarium and you can watch it create this red stream, uh -huh. samarium two chloride. And that after a minute, you see it like turning back into the plus three oxidation thing. It's very unstable, but samarium actually acts as its own reducing agent. So it's creating samarium plus three, but then the presence of the metal is reducing it to plus two. Yeah. And it's, it's really incredible to watch. And there's just, I mean, I, I'd say it's it's such a tiny number of people that even seen this this reaction occur in the world. Yeah, I've I've certainly never seen it. I, I look forward to seeing that too. Yeah, I'll have to send you the 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 link. So um so yeah, so there's uh there's order, but there's also all these exceptions and, and diversity, right? Yep. Yeah. In fact, Roald Hoffman had a book called uh, The Same But Different or something like that. You're right, he did. I think that's what he was getting at. <laughs> Roald was someone who really was not afraid to pursue his love of the humanities. He went all out and did books and plays and poetry and yeah, and still doing it. Yeah, and and he's 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 still doing it. So, um, so yeah, Eric, so I hope to, um, to have you learn more about chem talk and we're, we're at the stage that for a lack of a better word, we'll call it a great, great leap forward. We're at the point where we want some people to really take notice and help you know, in large ways or small, make this make this a, 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 a reality. So I'd be yeah. happy to 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 help in whatever way I can sign me up and uh, I'm in.
That's awesome. That's great. Right. Um, the papers are all created. The UPS truck is here. It'll be delivered at your house tomorrow. You just sign at the X and okay. no, I'm joking, but um, that's, that's, um, that's really exciting. Um, we're at this exciting stage where people are just starting to take notice and, um, uh, and, and that people are, 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 no pun intended, reacting very, very positively. And it's, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting. And, um, you know, we want, we want people to, again, Chem Talk is a vehicle, a public charity nonprofit that we want people to say, yes, this is, this can be a vehicle that can accomplish a lot. And let's, let's all figure out what purpose we want it to do. Do we want to promote a periodic table? Do we want to promote to young kids, old kids? Like there's just going to be some great conversations, but I think of it as like having the nibbleness of like a small startup, right? Like we don't have to go through committees. If we want to do something, show something to 150,000 people, we can just do it. Yeah. Yeah. Courtesy of TikTok and similar yeah, platforms. And, um, and even something like, what I really like about what you've done is, is you've, you've made an effort to reach different audiences, right? Like some, some of the things you put out are for people who are more established in science or academia and some is more the general public. And, and I think that's, that's an important way to do that, to reach different audiences. And that's, that's our approach too, where some of the, the things I think we need to do will be attractive to people who are more of a, a science background and some to just the general lay, lay person who, who just knows very, very little about what chemistry really is. So, right. Well, it's been fascinating talking to you, Scott. Uh, well, same here. And um, I will look into this question of helium, the gap between hydrogen and helium. That's uh, that's an interesting, interesting topic, which I'd never really thought about and um, worth looking into. Well, that's think, great. Uh, well, I will, I will be in, I will be in touch. I will send you the link today to some of those neodymium compounds. Good. And right. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks you too. Have a great have a great fourth. Well, that seems to be decent here in uh, in California, unlike many parts of the West. It's a, definitely oh, yeah. cooled off here today, and it's yeah. it's going to be cooler. In fact, I'm going to be near you. I'm going to have lunch in Santa Monica yeah. with some people tomorrow, so it'll uh, be nice to get back. Good. Good. My area. I can always, I can always benefit from the new suggestions of restaurants. We're let going me know if you true food or true life. I'll let I'll let you know how it is. Good, good. All right. Good to talk to you. Thanks, Eric. Same here. I'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. Okay, bye bye, Scott.